You're listening to All Things Video, the podcast dedicated to uncovering the past and charting the future of the online video ecosystem. You're listening to All Things Video. I'm your host, James Creech, and today's guest is Bastian Menitzveld, co-founder and executive chairman of TubiTube. Bastian, welcome hey, to the show. Yeah, yeah, great to be here, man. Thank you. Yeah, you're one of my uh, oldest friends in the digital media industry. So anytime I get to hang out and chat with you, it's a pleasure. And, you know, I wish we could be together in Madrid or L.A. at the moment. But, you know, hey, Zoom's the next best thing, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and, and, and it's been, uh, my God, it's been a wild ride, right? Like the, the five five years we've been working together. I think. That's right. Yeah, it's Almost been quite a journey. Years, yeah. Yeah. So I want to hear all about it. I thought we'd start by traveling a bit back in time. And maybe you could tell us how you got your start in media and entertainment. Uh, my start of media entertainment was like around uh, 1999. Uh, I I recently moved to Spain back then after spending my first three years working in London for a scientific publishing company where I was responsible. It sounds funny right now, but like back then it was like a thing. I was responsible for the internet. And this is like in a time where nobody knew what the internet was, right? Like it was before web browsers and... Uh, that scientific publishing company wanted to monetize or find ways to monetize their content that they were already like publishing in books and magazines, journals, as British people called them. Um, and they wanted to monetize it on that thing called like the internet. So that was my first job. And then after three years, I moved to Spain with the idea of, you know, also starting something on the internet, which was like a, which was like a thing in the year 1999, you know, it was like a boom back then. And um, basically by coincidence, while I was working on that, you know, trying to get like my entrepreneurial project on the internet going, um, I, I had the opportunity to work one day a week as a project manager for a UK television company that was building a project in Spain with a bunch of different Spanish uh, cable cable operators. And, and basically the thing they were doing is, you know, they convinced those cable operators that they needed to work together, have a joint venture, so they could jointly buy the rights to Hollywood content and other types of TV rights and turn that into TV channels and services. So typical thing that started me working for them one day a week and I ended up uh, working for them for years, I ended up as general manager of uh, the international side of their business. Uh, it was called the On Demand Group back then. And it became then part of Sea Change, which then became part of Viewbiquity, which it is today, the LA company that you probably know. And, um, and then at some point, uh, I, I wanted to have a go at, you know, doing my own thing and being entrepreneurial. And that was the birth of Bibenjo, mm. which was my first, you know, real, real company. Because okay. like the thing that I wanted to do on the internet in Spain was sort of like taken over by the opportunity of working in television, uh, which, you know, to me was, and, and in some ways, like still is one of the most glamorous and sexy things that exist professionally. Sure. So I'm mm. curious, you know, you're originally from the Netherlands. How did you end up in the UK and then ultimately in Spain? Okay. Um, I was born in the Netherlands. I studied in the Netherlands. I did some internships abroad. And one of those internships was in, in Spain for a US pharmaceutical company from mm. Bristol Myers Squibb. And I was 19 years old and I fell in love with Spain. And I'm still in love with Spain. You know, I think it's one of the best countries in the world. It's beautiful, beautiful people, weather, gastronomy, very big, you know, rich, diverse country where you have the greenest of greens and you have, you know, the hottest of hot and the desert on the other side and everything in between. You can ski, eat, drink, all to a super, super high standard. So I fell in love with, with everything. It wasn't a specific, you know, special person. I felt everybody everything about like the country was was special and then from then i was like obsessed with this idea of okay i belong in spain i need i need to make my way to the south of europe and you know like for me that focus then was spain and then you know as i got older i 
I broadened it like to uh, the whole south of Europe. My wife is Italian, for instance. So, uh, you know, like there, there's a general attraction, I think, here with the Mediterranean. Sure. So my, my, my idea was, okay, I'm going to finish uh, my, my studies. I studied business administration and I'm going to find a job in Spain and that is where I'm going to make my life. Now, now that didn't work out because I, I didn't know anybody in Spain. I didn't speak Spanish that well. And, um, you know, there, there weren't like a lot of jobs for the taking, you know, like back then, and I'm talking 96 right now. So uh, through my dad, who's a doctor and a scientist, I had like the opportunity to work for a contact of his, uh, the owner of like this scientific publishing company to be responsible for the internet. And that is how I got my first job in London. I had three super exciting years because like there, there was no bigger boom than the internet at that, you know, like day and age. So it was like a roller coaster ride, super exciting. And uh, then after three years, uh, I, I still wanted to go to Spain. So, because I still couldn't get a job. What I did is I, I saved until, uh, I had accumulated enough uh, sterling, you know, British British pounds, which at the time was like very strong. And the peseta, you know, it was like pre-euro time, wasn't so strong. So your pound went a long way. So I, I saved until I had like enough pounds to convert into pesetas to survive for a year. And with the confidence of, uh, I think it was 23 years old or something like that, 22, 23, the confidence of like, uh, 23 year old young man I went and I confided that you know everything was going to work itself out and I was going to make a future and then that's how I ended up uh, you know in in southern Europe uh, amazing yeah there is no stronger confidence than that of the 23 year old <laughs> that was beautiful but, but you, you know all about it like you're, you're closer right. to that than, than I am no? that's true that's true so you end up in Spain, and as you mentioned, you, you kind of jump into your first venture, Bibanjo, after your time in the TV business. So tell us more about that. What was the original inspiration behind Bibanjo? Well, in, in the TV business, uh, I, I was managing teams that had to deal with, you know, getting content in after it had been negotiated from like up to 80 different content providers, uh, scheduling it doing all the trafficking of like the materials, administering how that content was consumed, distributing it maybe on, you know, back then, maybe not so much, maybe five, six, seven, eight different platforms and then reporting back to each of those 80 content owners, how all that, uh, you know, went in order to be able to reconcile. So um, that if you think of it like in a schematic way becomes very, complicated and exponentially more complicated the more platforms or the more content providers you add and we were we were managing that literally in 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 microsoft excel you know doing huge excel sheets that you know at some point computers were also older and slower back then took ages to load that went like to the very limits of what you know excel and the machine it ran on could handle crashed and, and it wasn't a great way of doing it, but there were like no tools available for that, you know, new multi-platform on-demand world at that time. You know, right now we're used to getting content from HBO, from Netflix, from your cable operator, from like all sorts of over the top, from YouTube, from, you know, wherever. But like back, back then it was new. Like I'm talking about uh, 2008 right now. You know, uh, I think YouTube, barely existed or was just born around that that's time. right yeah i'm just gonna say this sounds like a familiar story it, it spotify was born at uh, at that time like i think we were born with Bibenjo more or less at the same at the same time as spotify spotify also did very well maybe even like a little bit a maybe little even bit a little bit better than Bibenjo, but a not much bit, a and um and, and 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 that was the inspiration like tools existed you know, to manage linear TV scheduling and linear trafficking of materials to get it like into 24 hour schedule, but it was like, you know, one channel and the technology behind a linear TV channel is, is pretty simple and it hasn't really changed a lot over the past 20 years or so. 
you know, like you package it, you schedule it so that it runs for 24 hours, you put like the ad breaks in between, and then you either put it like on a cable network or on like a satellite transponder and, and off you go, you know, it's not, uh, it's not so new, but like this whole idea of multi-platform distribution where there are no standards, every platform, even today, every digital platform has different standards, like uploading video on YouTube, Facebook, or Netflix, or Amazon, or your local cable operator, or Time Warner, or Comcast. Everybody uses different standards for metadata, for trailers, for box art. So um, at Bibenjo, my business partner, Jorge, so Benjo stands, the Benjo and Bibenjo stands for Bastian and Jorge. And, and I think I introduced you to Jorge once. Mm -hmm. um, so we thought we were going to, you know, run this, uh, through web browser, SaaS, you know, like the business that you're in, but that also was, you know, pretty new, like Salesforce was doing it, but not, not many other big companies, you know, it was, was new in, in 2008. And then, you know, we, we saw it there as, you know, like, you know, nobody needs to install anything. Everybody's working off the same information, the same database at the same time. Uh, it's not going to break because we're going to scale it on behalf of everybody. And, you know, it's going to be great and it's going to make people more efficient so they can do more things and distribute more content on more platforms with less resources so that was that was the idea and then that still is the idea behind uh, behind the venture terrific so had you always considered yourself an entrepreneur what was this thing tugging at you to say i want to start my own business i i, I think i was born that way james you know like since since i, I can remember since I was a kid, I was always looking for ways to, you know, what maybe I, I perceived as a kid as like ways to make a buck. Mm -hmm. uh, right, right now, being, being a bit more mature, I would, you know, describe it as ways to add value to whatever context, uh, you know, I was like operating in. And when I was a kid, it was maybe you know, going down the street and offering to clean people's gardens or wash people's cars or, uh, you know, like I think those, those were my first ventures. And then uh, a very tricky one. Like, actually, I did, I did like a number of risque ventures for like a young kid. Hmm. Um, I, I think, how do you call it? Like... Uh, when you commit like a small crime, there's like a number of years and then it expires and people can't put you in jail for it anymore. Like oh, statue, yeah, statue of limitations. Statue of limitation yeah. has expired right now, but <laughs> um, there, there was this very famous artist and, and, I, and I shan't mention his name, but he's one of my favorite musicians. And, um, and of course, part you know, of a big global record label and he issued this album, you know, like it was like still LPs then. I think CDs were also like a new invention. And and then he changed his mind before it hit the shop. So all all these albums had to be destroyed. And um, I managed. Don't don't ask me how because this was like pre the internet. And I I managed to get a cassette copy of that album through a contact in New York. Wow. He sent it to me from New York. I, I paid. I made an investment, which I remember was a lot of money. You know, it was maybe two months worth of like my weekly allowance that my parents gave me. But I saw very clear, I'm going to do this. And then I'm going to make duplicates of it, like on cassette tapes. And I'm going to put, I'm going to make another investment and uh, put like an advertisement in the newspaper. And so people can like buy that off me and then I'm going to sell them, send them because I, I never heard of things like copyright infringement or, yeah, sure. or, or anything, anything like that. But I, I, I think that was my, my first real. And how did it real, do? I'm on the edge of my uh, An entrepreneurial venture that sort of, sort of scaled. And then I had like another one. Um, well, hang on real quick. How many cassettes did you sell? I'm dying to know. I can't remember. Lots, lots of them. Okay, good. Oh, it worked out then. Huh? Lots of them. Like, you know, my, my weekly allowance was, you know, 
minority share of my total total income. Yeah. And, uh, and, and and then I had like another great business that um, that almost got me expelled uh, from school. Uh, you know, at that time, uh, my God, I, I should be careful because my daughter might be listening. <laughs> not to this podcast, but, um, you know, cigarettes were expensive in Holland and they were not so expensive in Spain. And I had like a friend in Spain and I sent him money and he sent me cartons of like Spanish cigarettes that I was like selling from my locker. And maybe like the price of those cigarettes was 20% of what they cost. Wow. Uh, in Holland and I sold them for 50% of what they cost in Holland. So I made, you know, a really good margin on it. So, so with, with, with those, you know, really trading kind of things, which yeah. I think is in, yeah. in the Dutch DNA almost because we're people of traders, you know, That's small, right. small yeah. it, it's how I got my, how I got my start. I love it. Wow. From an early age. I, I, I've never told this in the podcast or any <laughs> sort of public forum to, to anybody. I might, I might regret it. <laughs> well, I'd love that you uh, feel safe enough to share it with me. Those are awesome stories of trying to figure out creative ways to, to make money and, and start a business when you're young. That's awesome. Mm. What was the yeah. hardest part about being a first time founder when you launched the banjo? Um, well, I, I, I think, you know, what, what any, any entrepreneur, what they, what they try and do is like defy and manage risk. More, more defy it than, than manage it, you know, because any sensible person would never become like an entrepreneur. You have to be, you know, like common sense and logic doesn't apply to, to entrepreneurs because common sense tells you that nine out of 10 entrepreneurial projects fail, people lose money on it and they never go anywhere. So, you know, better to get a job and like find safety in that, you know? So common sense doesn't, doesn't work. So you do it, I guess, because you see an opportunity that defies logic, but you see it so strongly, so clearly, you believe in it like so much uh, that deep inside, you know that you have a really good shot at making it work, even though the universe tells you that you have all the odds against you. I, I don't know if you can, can empathize or identify with that, but that's, that's how I, I sort of feel. 100% agree. Yeah. That's, and, and, uh... then, and, then there, and then there's like the lure of freedom and independence, but, but that's more, I think, a lure and a constant than the reality because you're never truly independent because as an entrepreneur, you're dependent on your customers and your relation with them. And, you know, maybe you don't get like a boss that tells you what to do, but you get customers and the market and competitors that tell you what to do. So, yep. you know, or investors. In, in the there's always someone that you're reporting to. You always have to be beholden to somebody. Exactly. So, so I, I think that's, that's more conceptual, but I, I think the sort of attraction of creation of something that you have in your mind and then to turn it into reality, you know, that's what drives it. And then like the difficulty, you know, to come back to your original question is um, the road it will take you to, to get to where you feel in your heart and your head, you, you should be going and you can go, you know, it's, it's full of obstacles and sometimes you go along the road like fast and with more ease than you expected and oftentimes not and if i think back of my time in bibenjo with Horfu when we were starting them um it is a software company you're very familiar with you know what it is to have a software company so software starts with an idea either an idea you have in your head or a customer's requirement that you turn into an idea on a concept and then you need to execute it. And when you start making something that really doesn't exist and you're doing it at the beginning and you're doing it for the first time, um, what you have in your head can be crystal clear. But by the time that is actually a product that is valuable enough for people to pay money for it, 
you know, a lot of time can pass. And when you're an entrepreneur and time passes and you don't have income, but you have, you know, your office, your family, the two or three guys that you have like on your team to help you develop the product when you're just starting, all, all of this stuff must, must sound super, super familiar to you. Um, you know, a lot of time can go can go by. And, and I think the thing that, uh, that was hardest for us uh, was that it took us in reality, I think almost 18 months to cover our costs. And, you know, we kind of like hoped that it would have been six months, maybe. It always and takes then, longer than you think and is more expensive then, than you think. And then in those 18 months, you know, like you see your own savings dwindle and then you have to go to your friends and your family and, you know, like get them to lend you some of their savings. And, you know, it's pretty stressful. And then all of a sudden you got something that is value and people won't have it. And then you, you can turn the corner quite quite quickly also. But um, I think, you know, getting, getting that right and with experience, you get it right. Like you have a better idea right now of how long it will take you to build something and how much you need to invest before you get to the point that you can charge for it. But when you start from scratch, it's, it's a lot harder, especially if you're making something that nobody else is making and therefore nobody else is buying. And there's like a evangelism uh, an evangelical aspect to what you're selling, and yeah, and 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 that I remember very well from our first conversations because we we bonded over that because we that's right yeah we we, we, we empathize with that you know yeah when you're creating a market that didn't exist before yeah 100%. exactly yeah so you had a number of twists and turns along the way but ultimately a, a successful outcome for Bibanjo right it was acquired by French conglomerate TDF Group in 2014. So how did That's you right. know that, that TDF would be the right partner for, for the banjo to take it to the next level? Um, well, very, very, very simple. What, what has worked always for me, both on the, on the buying of business side as well as on the selling of, uh, of businesses, is at, at the end of the day, it all comes down to people, you know, like unless maybe you're buying a factory or something, but like the businesses that I have been involved uh, with, you know, like for, for one reason or the other, they, they depend on, on people. So uh, the model that has worked for me is a model where before buying a company or before selling a company, you're actually working with the company that you're buying or that you're selling to. And uh, MTDF was our customer. Our teams were working together. Uh, we had software integrations with their platforms going. So we had like a very operational uh, relationship as well as like an executive one. For a while, we partnered jointly, finding like some customers. Uh, and then that in a very natural way turned into an M&A conversation where of course we, we had like a process, you know, also a much longer process than you would anticipate because you think if you know each other so well, you know, it's a matter of like sitting down and agreeing like on a price. Yeah. And then, and, and, and my wife still doesn't understand to this day why M&A processes need to take so long. Okay, well, you have something where you know it, you trust it, you establish the value, you write a check, and then it's yours, or it's like not yours anymore. You know, like why, why do you have to have so many meetings and so many lunches for it to happen, or like worse, you know, for it not to happen after like so many, you know, so much time spent with so many people. Um, but but I think that's simply the way that the world works you know it's part of you know building trust and mitigating risk and um so that that took a while uh, but but it all you know it, it, it all was very very natural so that that process of like selling to tdf was you know maybe from our first hey how do you feel about selling your company to sitting at the notary which is a thing we have in europe you don't have it in the us um you know, six months and then, right. then it was done. Amazing. And, and, then, and then I woke up the next day and everything still looked the same. And, yeah. You know, not, and you say, what do I do not, now, huh? 
not, 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 not a lot changed, you know. I, I still went like to the office. The team was like still the same. The company wasn't ours anymore, and I, I had a bit more in the bank account. That's great. And what led you to uh, launch TubiTube, your next venture? What? Uh, how did you meet Fabienne, your co-founder, and, and what inspired you both to, to start the business? Well, Fab and I, we met. Uh, we met way before. We we even met before we venture. We met when I was working for uh, the On Demand Group. You know, Ubiquiti now. And uh, Fabienne is a real pioneer of uh, of digital. Uh, she's always worked for, for TV companies before starting to be too, just like I was working with TV companies before starting, uh, starting with Benjo. And um, at that time, she was working for a &E Networks in, in the US, you know, most famous for History Channel. And, uh, and, uh, and, and, and what's the, the big uh, Lifetime? Lifetime is also a big channel of them in, in the US. And she was the digital department, you know, in a similar way, like in, in, in London for the current science group, I was the internet. Yeah. She was everything digital when, you know, like TV companies weren't really doing digital. And I was her first customer. You know, see there, there's like a commonality in this because I think, you know, I was your first customer or maybe That's your second right. one. Yeah. Depending, depending on the definition in, in Europe. And I was her first customer paying for digital rights at A&E. And I remember uh, like we met to sign that deal in, in Cannes at, at MIPTV or MIPCOM, which is like a big trade show for, for you know, people in the content business. And I signed that deal outside on the street, on the Croisette, on the main boulevard on the back of uh, Sean Cohen. Like literally we got the contract, put it on his back and like signed it on his back uh, quickly before it started raining. Uh, and and Sean, Sean, great guy. He was uh, for many years head of international at a &E Network. So building all of their international business after another friend of mine, Steve Ronson did it. And, and, and he's moved on right now. He's at, uh, at Nielsen, I think. Great. So Fabienne was in a similar role, trying to figure out the internet, figure out digital media for these big TV companies. You two come together and realize this uh, shared experience. What was the motivation to say, hey, there's a need for Spanish language content and servicing creators in this ecosystem. Let's launch a business around it. Well, I, I, I got like two, two kids, twin daughters that are almost 18 years old. I would say 17, but they, since the day that they turn 17, they say I'm almost 18. But like in, <laughs> in a couple of months, they turn uh, two or three months, they turn 18. So we're yeah. almost there. And, and at that time, um, you know, they, they had like this generational shift, uh, I'm talking six, seven years ago, huh? where one day they're watching like Disney Channel on TV. And then the next day they're taking my iPad and they're more fascinated by YouTubers, which was like the first wave of content creators than they are by the internet. And they are more fascinated by what other kids make from their bedrooms than what, you know, big media companies offer kids their age. And that was a revolution. And I, I remember being very fascinated with that because I saw it like happening in front of my eyes, you know, in my, in my living room. And um, if you come from the TV world, you tend to be a bit arrogant about it. You think, how can it be, you know, like, you know, production values and industry and experience and billions worth of investment. And there's like some kids, uh, you know, with zero production value doing that from, from his or her bedroom and uh, it can't be like, you know, it must be bullshit, you know? Um, it wasn't. And then and the more I looked into it, the clearer I saw it was like a global phenomenon. So I started to talk to other people about it. Uh, and, and, and Fab, she was working for Canal Plus uh, in France where she was head of digital. And, and part of her responsibility was 
you know, to look at independent content creators and YouTubers and, you know, like she had like an MCN as part of it and kind of lose invested in maker studios and, and then did like some other things there. And so, so she was also like, you know, on top of this. So we, we, we started to talk about it and uh, we were both very fascinated with it. Uh, in the US, you had maker studios already, already then. You know, this was which Canal Plus invested in, right? With Fabian yeah. uh, during her time there. Yeah. Exactly. And this was just before when we were talking about it and like being also excited about it and like exploring it was just before uh, Maker sold to, to Disney. And uh, in the north of Europe, you also had like some initiatives from like RTL, Style Hall, uh, Studio 71. Uh, in the UK, you had Brave Bison and like a b bunch of these other guys, but there wasn't a lot happening in the Spanish speaking parts of the world. And whatever was happening was all very small scale and very cautious. Um, so we, we saw opportunity there. And uh, my commitment uh, with the TDF group uh, was, was coming to an end. And I was like itching to start something new. and. Uh, and, uh, you know, Fabienne, uh, she was very happy at Canal Plus, but like this was like a great, great opportunity. And we, we just decided to give up our jobs and, you know, go, go all in. And that was the start of, of Tubi2. Amazing. And you were already in Madrid. You spoke Spanish, right? But how did you convince Fabienne, this, you know, TV uh, contact you had known for years, who's over in France to say, hey, the opportunities in the Spanish market Let's quit your big fancy full-time job, learn Spanish, and we're going to launch this business focused on the Spanish language market. Yeah. Um, well, a couple of things. Like Fabienne already spoke a bit of Spanish, and she's, you know, extremely bright and and quick to learn. So it took her about four days to to become fluent at it. <laughs> um, and um, she lived in the U.S. For many many years you know like a big part of her career was like in the us and and in in asia and, and in europe but like uh, i don't know the exact number but but more than 10 years she lived in in the us and uh as you know like miami is like a gateway to latin america uh spanish there's probably more people in the us that speak spanish than people who do not speak spanish in in the us uh so you know, it was like a pragmatic thing. We, we decided like to start together. She was going to spend some months with me in Madrid to, you know, give it like the first push and then move to Miami to uh, get, uh, you know, like the US is spending a Latin American part of a running. And that was, that was the beginning of, of 2v2. Terrific. So mm. for those listening who maybe aren't so familiar, uh, what are the differences that you see between say the Spanish market uh, in, in, Europe specifically in, in Iberia compared to the U.S. Hispanic population and even with Latin America, these are these are all Spanish language, Spanish speaking territories, but they have very different cultural uh, nuances, right? So, what are what are some of those differences that you've observed? Uh, you know what, James? Like you, you would say that, but I I, I think. Uh... I'm definitely showing my age, but you're showing your age a little bit also because. For a 16 year old today, those cultural differences aren't so big because the cultural differences are not based on, on our definition of culture anymore. Like our definition of culture is maybe, you know, like more based on, on countries or borders or nationalities. And for, for the younger generation, I believe it's culture is either something that appeals to them because it's cool or because it isn't. And then and, and we see that in how well creators translate and export across different cultures, you know, like and how they find global followings. And I think um, TV, at least here in Europe, is still very local. I think Hollywood and, and the big US production companies are probably the one exception to it in creating content that travels globally, uh, but it's still US content, if you understand what I mean. You know, it's still content made in a Hollywood-esque 
type of way, giving uh, a sort of very Hollywood type of impression and view of what the world is like that, you know, appeals very, very globally. Whereas like TV, I think is like still more local. But if we then look at digital and we look at kids and how they consume content, I think it's much more organic and instinctive and emotional in terms of its appeal. And and they don't make an analysis of, well, this comes from my neighborhood or it comes from my country or my city or, you know, it's, I identify with this or I don't, you know, and in that sense, you know, the world has become a huge playground. You know, when, when I was a kid, I was like into rock music when everybody was like into, into other stuff, like into like first into hip hop and then into grunge, you know, like into Nirvana. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I was like into 60s and 70s rock. And I didn't have like a lot of people to relate with because it wasn't trendy. It was just like my personal taste. But like today you're into some very exotic, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure there's like not a lot of people here in Spain that are into, uh, Celtic folk songs. And if you would be, you know, in the 80s, a Spaniard into Celtic folk songs, probably very hard like to find a community of like-minded souls that, you know, you could share that passion with. And right now, with the internet, with YouTube, you can find them anywhere. You can find them anywhere. And it becomes yeah. like a global, global community, you know? For sure. So it's, that's fascinating that, that change has happened, that accent no longer matters, geographical borders don't matter because if you speak Spanish, you can enjoy content, whether you're in Mexico, in Ecuador, in Spain, you know, in Argentina, right? All of these places share the same language and, and can now enjoy the same content. Yeah, yeah, and then, and then, and then you have, and, and I think this is, you know, the challenge for production companies and, and content creators is, within that to find concepts and formats that have like a real universal and global appeal. I think Hollywood is really good in that uh, when it comes to storytelling. I think, and then now I'm sort of, you know, patting myself on the back a little bit for being Dutch. I think uh, the Dutch people are very good at inventing global successful formats that have like an appeal like things like big brother or uh, the voice Idol or the, Vo the voice or, or temptation island uh, the temptation island i'm not sure it's dutch actually mine might well be uh, but but <laughs> and, and, and the ball is like great at it and then we have like a bunch of other other production companies you know like game show formats uh iWorks also a great company we get like a bunch of great dutch companies that that invent these things that you know go also beyond cultures uh, go beyond local cultures and appeal to like a more global culture yeah amazing and you know earlier you talked about how when you do an acquisition right when you are evaluating the the tdf opportunity for bavanjo it's all about the people right and, and you've made a number of partnerships so you've made some acquisitions during your time your six-year history with tubi tube uh, perhaps the one that stands out the most to me is in Shufei TV, right? Touche Films. So how did you meet that team? And, and you know, what, what did you decide was the key to a successful partnership with them? Okay. Um, we, we, we met them through one of our Latin American offices. That was uh, the, first, uh, the first contact. Uh, we are in Mexico. Uh, they have their base in Ecuador. And they were looking for a company or, or someone to represent their commercial interests in the Mexican territory. So that was our first point of contact. So we became their representatives in Mexico with our Mexican office, just like we represent like a lot of talents, you know, our channels. Um, you know, that, that was like the start. So that's how we started to work together. That was, I think, the first year of us working together. Then. The second year of working together, uh, like, you know, many, many creative companies, their, um, their, their, their bottom line is either 
uh, finance or, or, or distribution, right? Like they they had lots of great ideas, like or, or we, I should say, right now, lots of creativity, uh, loyal audience. Uh, but then, like in order to implement that, you know, like you need finance and you need distribution and things like that. So in in the second year, we actually came on board as a co-producer. So we invested in their production capability, uh, also like helping them. Uh, in a production, if you do it on that level, it, 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 it's a very, it's not like your business, like your SaaS business, where you have customers paying your, you every month and your payroll is, you know, pretty much the same every month. But if you work in the production thing, like you're developing something for nine months of the year, and then you need to spend lots of money during three months a year to go like in, into production that you then need to recover during the other nine months of like the year. So in terms of your cash requirements, uh, it, it's, it's different, you know, and the only way to overcome that is like to either scale and, you know, have several successful productions like going on simultaneously with like different cycles. So it like evens each other out or to find external partners or co-producers to, to help share the risk with you. So that was, our, our second step in the relationship. And then the third step in the relationship was what well, we really believe in each other. And we believe that like together we can do more than alone. And that is when uh, we made an acquisition, we made a majority acquisition, uh, another full acquisition. And really conceptually, when you are selling that and you're getting in the same boat, um, like, the money might flow in one direction and like the the equity like in the other direction but you're really both buying something right like you're both buying into each other's into each other's future so uh and that's where i think it comes down to the people again yeah absolutely and they've gone on to have tremendous success right you've partnered on a lot of incredible productions most recently, mm -hmm. you know, the Mortal Glitch series uh, for YouTube, right? It was commissioned by YouTube and has had enormous success on the platform. So what is the, you know, what does the future hold for uh, your partnership with Enchufe? Okay. So Mortal Glitch was, was beautiful. Like we, we have, uh, I'm not going to single anybody out in particular, or maybe I should. Nah, I'm, I'm not, but you know, we, we, we have, I have like, Fantastic business partners in Ecuador. We have a fantastic team in place. Uh, you know, really, really, everybody, everybody is like great on that uh, on that team, and uh, we we have a great relationship with uh, with Margie Moreno from from YouTube Originals, who you know really gave us this opportunity, who trusted us to pull it off, and I think uh, you know it paid off great dividends, uh, you know, both for us as well as for for them. Uh, it was a great project, great collaboration, and we had uh, spectacular results in terms of uh, of audience. And uh, you know, we worked on that for well over a year. It was like a, a big production for us, entirely done in Ecuador. Uh, I think you've seen it. You know, it looks looks spectacular. It does. It really does. We we managed to, I think, you know, stretch and get like the maximum out of like every production dollar imaginable. I think, you know, for, for the cost per minute, you know, it, it, it looks, it looks twice as expensive as it really was, you know, uh, and I, I don't have like an ambition to, to become like a low cost producer or anything, but I think, you know, we really, you know, did, did like a very, very cool thing there. And uh, I, I hope to do more. I, I think that, you know, TV as a format and episodes and seasons are like a wonderful way to to tell stories and like stretch it out over more time. Um, so we got like a bunch of projects on the go, uh, you know, in a, in a more TV kind of format, fiction, uh, also some nonfiction. And then we got a bunch of movie projects uh, on the go. We, we had our first movie. I think there you can see the poster behind yeah. me. Um, we just finished shooting our second movie, Misfit, uh, also in Latin America, which was uh, a real adventure. Huge risk also to shoot a movie like during COVID times because uh, 
it's impossible. And if it's possible, it's definitely not easy because for us it was impossible to get insurance. Mm. And, uh, you know, if you have like an outbreak of COVID during a shoot, which costs a lot of money every day, uh, you run the risk of having to write off like a big investment. And uh, we, we took all of the precautions imaginable. Uh, we, we basically confined uh, all of the cast and the crew like in a, in a hotel and had secure transport between that and the set and tested everybody for COVID like almost every day and the disinfectation and you know, any, anything you can imagine like really, really strict protocol for COVID and, and also, uh, and I think that was like a first uh, in, uh, in, in our shoot. We had a... Uh, sexual harassment protocol for the first time like on the shit not because it ever happened but because you know we took a protocol that was designed and we decided to implement it so that people working on the set could feel could feel completely safe at all times you know because you know like me too has been like a big thing globally and a lot of that actually came to light because of uh, things happening in in the tv and movie production uh, business that's right uh, I think that's where it became more visible, uh, but I think it's everywhere. I think it exists in uh, in, in restaurants and companies, and like bars and in schools and educational, uh, in, in religions and churches. You know, like Sadly, it, it, yes. it, 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 it just happened that Hollywood and and production made it more more visible. But you know, like the advantage of that being visible is that you can also take like. A leadership role in you know exemplary behavior and, and that's why we decided to implement that as a protocol it's not very difficult it's common sense but like you know through communicating that everybody felt safe for the COVID, and everybody felt uh, safe for uh harassment and uh, and we were very careful uh and thankfully we made it through the entire shoot without having any COVID uh, incident of course, no arrestment incidents uh, whatsoever. Amazing. Very good. Yeah. And when will that film premiere? When will it come out? It will be ready. Um, oof, no, I'm, I'm not going to mention an exact date, uh, but, but let's say somewhere between Q1 and Q2 of, uh, of next year. All right? right. So it's all done. We're in post-production and then we need to, you know, get like the whole marketing and distribution campaign going. Uh, I, I think the challenge there is, you know, like theatrical releases is, is a pretty tricky thing right now with COVID because nobody knows how and if and when and to what capacity movie theaters uh, will open. Some people and some businesses are very pessimistic and say it will never happen again and the world will change uh, forever. Others are, and, and I would include myself in that camp, optimistic saying, well, it's a very cheap form of entertainment, you know, like to get out of the house and like have an evening out mm -hmm. compared to, you know, going on vacation or going on holiday, uh, eating out for dinner or whatever, going you know. A concert, going, yeah. going to the mall and watching a movie is not super expensive and it is like a real evening out and something that, you know, gives food for thought and conversation. And uh, in a world where people will have, you know, less money, less disposable income uh, because everything is going to be tighter uh, economically, I still believe it's like a good, very good alternative for people wanting to get out of the house and like do something that's, you know, fun whether it's like as a family or like with friends or you know i i I, st I still believe in it but when and if and how that come back uh, comes back depends on the COVID situation and um we're, we're in good company you know like james bond is ready to be released you know it's been ready uh, they're sitting on it they're sitting on it like to find the right moment and the right release strategy so once that moment is there uh, i think we, we don't want to go on the same day as james bond because i don't I don't think that will work very, very well competitively. But you know, one, one week before, like a few weeks, few weeks after, yeah, maybe. 
Fair you know, enough. so we'll, 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 we'll have to keep an eye on it. You know, like we, we live in in a strange in a strange time, but ready it will it, it will be ready between Q Q1 and uh, and Q2 of next year. Fantastic. Well, we'll look forward to that. And as we're thinking ahead to the future, what uh, predictions do you have? Any any things that you're observing for the future of the media and entertainment space? Um, yeah, but a bunch. I like didn't you ask me for like a list? And I sent yeah. you like like a list a while back for for what, what, what was that for? Oh gosh, I may have done uh, predictions, but uh, that was years and years ago. I feel like maybe in 2018 or 2019. Yeah, yeah I think so. <laughs> Did I, I send so. you something recently? No, no, no I, I think, but but like, the last year yeah. went, went by so quickly because it was like such a weird year that you know it might have been late 2019 and feel like it was five years ago. You know? That's true. Um, I think what we'll see also because of like the economic times that we're living in is consolidation. Uh, I think some smaller companies uh, struggle to make ends meet. Everybody's got to watch their cost. Everybody's got to watch uh, you know, the ways in which they work with people. So I think, you know, I'm pretty sure you're, you're working with resources that are more flexible using them as and when you need them and not like having them on your payroll 12 months a year and you know, taking really good care of the people that you have on payroll and that form your core team uh, because you know it's a difficult time and to be competitive you need to have like a really strong team but then you know customers as and when they come and go and need to scale uh, you'll, you'll find more flexible ways to, to do that and I think the market works like that uh, on all sides I think our customers work like that. So we have to work like that and we have to find, you know, solutions that tune, tune into it. So I think that's, that's a big one, uh, both on the internal as well as like on the external side, both on like how we hire and spend our money as well as how we go into the market and, you know, propose solutions for our customers. I think um, digital media will continue to grow. Uh, I, I think actually in the last year, in terms of consumption, it, it, it's grown like crazy in terms of monetization, not so much because it just meant, okay, well, right now we have like a bigger pie uh, and the same or less advertising money to divide amongst that bigger pie. So that, that's not great, but at least it gives us a, a sense and an indication of where the eyeballs are. And I think, you know, that's, that's a shift that's, that's here to stay. And the challenge is to, to make that more valuable and uh, to learn a little bit from like what happened to, you know, like the shift from uh, physical media to digital media and the music industry. I, I think there, a lot of new value was created and a lot of old value was like swept off like the table and uh, some traditional players like, you know, played along with it very efficiently and like seized it as an opportunity and others, uh, you know, saw their business decimated and became marginalized and what you see then, and I think that will happen in our digital media industry also, uh, you see consolidation. I think uh for a company like tube tube is longer term is we either become we find a way to become one of those you know really big big players you know like with a five to ten year window or we become part of one of them uh and i think sitting still is not uh, a really great great option you know because then you just become like a marginal boutique uh, boutique thing and and you don't sit like why why is it important to get to scale uh if if i divide the business up that we have in in two parts one is like a digital marketing part called to be two and the other one is like a production part which is to be originals um scale is very important and in digital marketing you know like the big companies the big digital marketing groups they have a better seat at the global negotiation tables of like the big brands making mouse deals to spend money. And you want a seat on those big tables. 
because if not you're fighting for you know 10 or 20 or 30 k here or there and like what you want is you know like the big deals that solve a big problem uh, in a very efficient and valuable way and and that is like where where you want to be and and same thing for uh, for the production side of the business yeah terrific Hmm. And, and Bastian, one of my favorite questions to ask everyone who comes on the show, I'm particularly excited to ask you, given you have that entrepreneurial mindset that's constantly thinking of you know, new businesses, new opportunities. If you were starting a new business in the digital media and entertainment space today, knowing everything you've learned along the way, what would you do? A new business today? Yeah. Where's the new opportunity? Is it podcasting? Is it you know, new video and audio formats, what's getting you excited? What would you go out and attack next? Okay, so here, here, here's my counter question to you. Like before I answer, does, does it have to make money or can it be for fun or ideological reasons? I'll take anything. Yeah, I, I have some passion project businesses that if I had more time, I would love to run, even if they didn't make that much money, it would just be a fun, fun pursuit. Um, I, you, you know, it's... As I grow older, I, I feel more and more European. I, I identify more as like European than as like Dutch, which it says on my passport, simply because I've, I've had that kind of life. You know, like uh, I've lived in different places in Europe. My wife is Italian. My kids were born in Spain there. You know, they speak five languages pretty fluently. And I really identify as a European. And I think in Europe, we have a common culture. I think, um, you know, in spite of all the political efforts, um, that isn't really a sentiment that, that lives amongst the younger generation. And I think, you know, like a, a bunch of things can can like play a big role in changing that. And I think for us to be competitive or for the next generation, because it's more something that you start right now and then the future generations will have a benefit of it. Um, th they will come together or they won't because of, of media or because of like influences. And I think uh, media, digital media can play a big role in, you know, bringing people together and if i would like you know have like a new job or like a new project i would love to find something around europe and like you know like the future generations identifying you know as as dutch or as german or as spanish or as portuguese but also as, as european because right now for like these kids it's still an abstract thing it's probably clear to understand for like us as adults because we understand how economy works like you know a country that sends money to like another part of europe knows why it is and they either like it or they don't but they know how that works but like kids don't have this this thing and i think it's important i think you know in the us you you have that like you have like states that are independent you're all americans like a, a texan identifies as the texan but also as an american just like a new yorker or a californian or somebody from uh from Oregon or North Carolina, whatever you know, yeah, like, it's true. You can you can identify as, as as both things. You can identify as a New Yorker and as American at, at the same time. And I think here in Europe, people identify as a Spaniard or like a Dutch or maybe even like as a global citizen before they identify as European. And I mm -hmm. think that is important in order for us. You know, then we we talk about again like having a having a strong seat at the table. To be strong, you know, like because you have Russia very strong, you got Asia very strong, you got like US very strong, and then you know we have Europe, but it's sort of like man could could be better. I think there's a lot more potential than we're realizing. I would love for the future generations to realize it and for for media and then communications to play a role in bringing that together. And I got some very specific ideas that we could talk about, like in another. We'll do it over a beer sometime. That sounds amazing. I love the power if, of media to unify. If, if, yeah. if, if, if I could, you know, like do do a new project, I would do something around that. Cool. That's exciting. I really like that idea. And, and especially as someone 
you know, as you said, this new generation is growing up in a world where the traditional boundaries don't make as much sense, aren't as applicable, right? The linguistic challenges, the territorial boundaries, these are all just kind of artificial constructs, but you can use media, you can use entertainment and culture to break down those barriers and unify people under the things that we share more in common than, than accentuating the differences, the small differences that we might have. So exactly. very cool. Bastian, where can people find out more about you and more about TubiTube? tubitube.com uh, that's the digital marketing site to be originals.com uh, at to be on Twitter uh, and about me uh, I'm, I'm, I'm not so big on my social network so I think my LinkedIn is on linkedin.com slash in slash Bastian M or bamamedia.com, which just has a link to my LinkedIn and not, not a lot more. There we go. Well, we'll let people track you down. And uh, if they're ever passing through Madrid, hopefully drop you a line. But uh, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Uh, you know, like I said, I wish we could get together, but looking forward to doing that when it's all over. And fascinating for me, someone who's known you for five or six years now, to get to peel back a few more layers and learn about your journey and your background. So thanks again for sharing. Let, 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 let's do a little game here, James, before sure. we... Uh, we wrap up. Uh, right. let, let, let's try and make uh, make a prediction here, because okay. like this, pod, this podcast will be here for eternity, and sure, now we're we, we're exposed with whatever we're going to say right now. When do you think uh, we'll we'll meet again in person? I think we'll meet again in 2022. I would love to come and see you maybe this fall if it were safe to do so, but I still think the international travel is going to be tricky. Um, and while I would love to end up in Spain, there are probably a few other places I need to go first, like Poland and uh, maybe Vietnam. But, uh, but I hope there's a chance for us in 2022. How about you? Um, I, I, I'm an optimist. James, I'll, I'll come to visit you in Los Angeles uh, before 2021 is over. Amazing. I love that. Well, come to LA. We'd love to see you. And, Happy to host and, you. Uh, uh, you know what? If I'm right and I visit you in 2021, you'll buy me lunch. And if you're right, then we'll have to wait till 2022. I will buy you lunch. It's a deal. Cool, man. Really yeah. looking forward to it. Yeah, likewise. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Great to see you. And uh, well, don't be a stranger. I hope it's not too long before I do get to see you. Thank you very much, James. Go well. Thanks for tuning in. I'm James Creech, and this has been another edition of All Things Video. If you like what you hear, we hope you'll share and subscribe for new episodes. See you next time.